Georgina, we're you know, going to delve into each of the kind of therapies, uh, you know, and their kind of the, the strengths, the weaknesses, if you will. So we'll start with with, with BRF inhibitor based therapy. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, we we've we've had two BRF inhibitors on the market as monotherapy with phase three trial, better than decarbazine MEK inhibitor monotherapy, all in the V600 BRF mutant population. Now three randomized phase three trials with pretty mature follow up at this point. Um, with dabrafenib, trametinib, and vemurafenib, cobimetinib. So maybe you know, briefly summarize you know, how you digest the information, how you present it to patients on kind of the strengths of you know, the evidence regarding that therapy. Um, maybe tuck in there also, uh, are there patients who you still think about brafenib or monotherapy for, or is it you know, BRF mech uh, for all? Okay, so just to answer your last question, the data is very clear. BRAF plus mech is superior to BRAF inhibitor alone. There is no role for single agent BRAF inhibitor. I don't think I've ever given a patient single agent BRAF inhibitor with those three randomised trials. So we're talking mm -hmm. COMBI-D, dabrafenib and trametinib versus dabrafenib. We're talking COMBI-V, which is dabrafenib and trametinib versus vemurafenib. And we're talking COBRIM, which is vemurafenib combined with COBIMETINIB versus vemurafenib. The amazing thing is that the one year and the two year overall survivals for the combinations in each of those trials was almost exactly the same. So we're talking 74, 75% one year survival in that group. These are BRAF mutated patients, of course, V600. And then a two year overall survival in a pooled analysis of dabrafenib and trametinib, 53% in cobrim, 48%, all within you know, a few percentage points. So very clear benefit of the combination over BRAF inhibitor. I do not see a role for BRAF inhibitor monotherapy at all in any patient. Sometimes people make arguments, for example, the effect of MEK inhibitors on the heart, which is actually reversible. Even in that setting, you know, I, I test it out. I test the double it out in patients with heart failure. That's, so that's the first important fact. Um, the next thing was, so, so they're similar. They're all similar. The differences for dabrafenib and trametinib and vem, cobi, and they've never been compared head to head, so that's a really important point, um, is probably in the toxicity profile. So dabrafenib and trametinib, the main uh, toxicity that is an issue is fever, pyrexia, um, which can be managed, but does require a bit of experience. It can be managed with intermittent treatment, so just stopping the patient. The, the difficult bit's the first three months. If you can get patients through that, mm -hmm. they tend to be sailing well by six months, they're really good. So it's the fever management for dabrafenib and trametinib, which can also be managed with steroids. Um, and then for vemcobi, it's the rashes, the diarrhea, it's fever's not a, a major problem for that group. So that's really the difference between the two combinations. Um, so that answers your set of questions. Mm -hmm. Did you want to delve into the beneficiaries for these drugs at this point or not yet? Yeah, well, I think, as you said, from an efficacy perspective, I think we kind of treat the, you know, the brf mech you know, approach as a therapeutic unit. Um, and then for argument's sake, dabrafenib and trametinib, vem, cobi, hard to parse between the two. So considering, you know, brf mech as a strategy, um, you know, Jason, you were alluding to before the kind of, uh, you know, evidence regarding, you know, patient selection or, you know, sort of subsets. Um, you know, how do you, you look at the evidence as it's been presented for either of the BRF mech strategies? Um, you know, how do you talk to a patient, uh, you know, with high disease burden about what your expectations are, right? I mean, many people in practice, I think, have felt like BRF inhibitor based therapy, you know, going back to BRF inhibitor monotherapy days, um, you know, was kind of just, that's what you had as, a, as an option to, at least to start with. Um, but what, you know, what, what's your, your, your take and, and how do you present it to patients in terms of kind of near term to intermediate term expectations? Well, I, I feel very comfortable telling most patients we should see very quick onset of, of clinical benefit. And so in patients who are symptomatic and who have BRAF mutations that are identified, I, I really usually try to I tell them I, I really think this is the best approach because you'll feel better quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, getting out to high burden patients, perhaps liver metastases or brain, that question of where will we be in six months, it, but it's an open question. I don't think we generally have the answer to that, but I, I sort of tell patients that the best, from my, my perspective, the best decision-making process is what do we have, what do we know now? And if the patient's symptomatic now, then we treat the patient now, and then we think about what's going to be the next, and this dovetails with what we discussed before. We have many active agents now, so knowing how we're going to use them, I think, is, is an open question, mm -hmm. and it's, people need experience with each one. Yeah. Uh, but so in a patient, especially maybe a, a, a lower performance status patient mm -hmm. where I'm concerned mm -hmm. that 
if we had a side effect of an issue, um, start with the BRAF inhibitor, d you know, debulk the disease at a minimum, and then mm -hmm. reassess and rediscuss what treatment options would potentially be offered. The other one, big area that comes up is in the context of sort of patients who have autoimmunity or other sort of just variants on the standard patient that you would think of. Um, that setting, then I think it's much more clear that you just get the drug started quickly. And I just wanted to just comment very quickly on what Georgina said about the side effect profile. Um, I, I, my personal experience is that, you know, it, it's at least 50% to get the fevers, but the most important thing, just let the patient know. You start getting chills, you start getting, just stop. Just stop the drugs, it'll be, because patients don't like to stop. They think, oh, stop the cancer drug, it's gonna be terrible. In reality, it doesn't have any effect on efficacy at all, and you can literally avoid hospitalizations for dehydration. Just stop the drugs for a few days, it'll recover, you go right back to it and everything. So I would well. sit a patient in a separate room and they get a whole conversation, not only with me, but in a separate room with a nurse. Right. And the biggest thing is contact us, just stop the drugs if in doubt, stop the drugs. Right. And reinforcing the fact that it does, it's not a negative thing on your cancer to stop for two, three days. Yeah, in fact, right. it's better because you're not gonna be stopping for a week. Right. You're just gonna be stopping for 48 hours. But speaking but, of stopping, has, have these uh, discontinuous trials gotten any traction? Well, the, the, the biggest trial on, on that point is, is not two, three days off therapy, but a couple of weeks off therapy, yeah. meaning several weeks on, uh, two weeks off. Um, and that's a strategy that has some preclinical science behind it. But I would say we haven't seen any evidence yet that that uh, spares us on toxicity, prolongs overall disease control. Still a provocative hypothesis, but uh, you know, when I've been asked by practitioners in the community on that topic, I'd say not ready for prime time in terms of a, a treatment strategy to build into practice now. Can I just make a comment? Because we haven't actually commented on the actual response rate of targeted therapies. Um, so the overall response rate using RESIST is near 70% across mm -hmm. the board, but tumor reduction occurs in 95% of patients. And that's why we're sitting here all confidently saying, pre-surgery would give it. Mm -hmm. If they've got high burden, you want quick control, we'd give it. The issue, though, is that those very patients with high burden of disease, high LDH, do poorly across the board on treatments. But we know, as Jason was alluding to, that they're probably going to progress by four months if they've got a very, very high LDH. We know that. We've seen the data. The progression-free survival in that subgroup is, is not good on any treatment. But because the debrafenib trametinib studies have really delved into that, we actually have the data and can say high LDH progress very quickly. Yeah, you know, I, I would pull out though from the, this year's ASCO uh, now with three-year follow-up, the high LDH group, we'd kind of given up hope on them at the two-year. Turns out actually that a, that a 15 to 20% subset of high LDH patients are still alive and well at three years. Do you know who they are though? They're the one to two. They're the elevated LDH yes, between but not so one bad. and two. Yes, right. They're not the fair two point. times upper limit. That's a fair point. And we saw that in the pooled analysis. Yes. When right. we delved into LDH, we saw a clear separation between LDH one times two upper limits of normal versus two. Three year survival for people with a, a LDH above two was 7%. That's overall survival. Yeah. Um, whereas for one to two, it was up near, I don't know, 20% or something like that. Yeah, I I, this exactly. is an important point actually, right? Because we, we've been very quick about talking about LDH. Yeah, and I think, I think for those who don't see as many melanoma patients as we do, 1.1 times upper limb normal is not all hope lost. No, uh, no. Uh, you know, four times upper limb normal is, that's, is, is that's, you know, kind of the, the type of patient we're talking about that's in a really tough spot.